I mentioned that event for Donald Trump in Washington last night where he said if he loses this election, he will blame the Jews. Meanwhile, here's what he said about reinstating a travel ban if he returns to the White House. We will seal our border and bring back the travel ban. Remember the famous travel ban? We didn't take people from certain areas of the world because I didn't want to have people ripping down and burning our shopping centers and killing people. But we're not taking them from infested countries. Infested countries. Joining the conversation, MSNBC political analyst and publisher of the newsletter, The Inc., available on Substack, our good friend Anand Girdardis. Anand, it's good to see you this morning. Um, what do you hear in those comments? Uh, we've heard him make similar comments about vermin coming from other countries. We've heard him talk about s-hole countries, uh, the Haitian immigrants who are in Springfield, Ohio, for example, about 15,000 of them are here legally under temporary protected status. So what do you hear in those comments from Donald Trump? I hear a wannabe Nazi without the organizational skills. You know, I hear someone who is literally reclaiming language from the 1930s and 1940s in Germany, vermin infestation. Uh, this is the language of someone who is not just trying to win an election, although they are trying to do that. Uh, this is the language of someone who is trying to build a pretext for what he might do if in office. He's talked about, you know, deporting millions and millions of people on a scale that would require, you know, 24 seven train cars and buses, camps, uh, to use another mid 20th century word. Um, but also, I think, and, and, and the example of the, the Haitian community in, in Springfield illustrates this, someone who is using a modern media environment to spread information, uh, put out lies, that will then possibly inspire other people, private actors, to do things in their own name with deniability for Donald Trump. Um, and a kind of, you know, activating his stand up and stand back and stand by kind of pa paramilitary friends uh, to go do all manner of uh, things to vulnerable people. Because once you're telling millions and millions of people that there, there's vermin around, there's infestation, they're, they're taking over the country, there's a replacement scheme scam happening, uh, violence will happen. So now let's talk a little more about what's happened there in, in, in Springfield. You're from Ohio? I am. Um, and not too far from there. And we have seen that Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, have refused to disavow what they've said. These are lies, racist lies about the migrant community there. You've written about this. Um, tell us what this, how this story has resonated with you. You know, I mean, I, it, it was a trifecta for me. I am an Ohioan, native Ohioan. I am a son of immigrants. Uh, and I'm a passionate eater and, uh, and cook. And so this sudden, you know, national story about, you know, this kind of uh, dehumanization of immigrants based on what they eat. A couple of things. First of all, in a lot of countries in the world with unstable political systems and high levels of violence, uh, lies about what other people eat is actually crucial to how political violence happens. In India, where my family comes from, if you look at most episodes of lynchings or riots, it is Hindus and Muslims and rumors about I smelled pork, I smelled beef, you're inappropriately smuggling something you shouldn't have been eating. A lot of countries in the world, taboos around food and violence. So, so this, is, this was what was happening in Ohio is a playbook that is very familiar if you've covered politics in, in developing countries. Um, it is a classic dehumanization thing to say these people are the other. They're, you know, as, as Kendrick Lamar would say, they not like us, they eat differently from us. Um, but it got me thinking, what do, immig what do immigrants eat? Because immigrants don't eat what Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are lying about. Um, and, you know, one thing immigrants eat in this country is, are flavors that everybody else eventually eats and capitalizes on, right? Uh, and then you have gochujang in, in, in uh, you know, fancy little new American restaurants, and you have fish sauce, uh, you know, in a, in a vinaigrette several years later. But, but immigrants are people who bring that flavor to us. And what is multiracial democracy but flavor? You know, immigrants swallow their pride often to come to this country, uh, come to places like Springfield, Ohio, often do jobs that they wouldn't have had to do back home. They're computer programmers back home. They work in a gas station yeah. in Springfield um, because they know that to rise in America, you must first fall sometimes. So they, you know, they eat their own, their own pride. They, they often eat very little in the hope that their children yeah. will eat like kings. They eat 
the cheapest food they can get at Costco because they can taste what their grandchildren, unborn grandchildren, will eat one day. Um, and when I was growing up in Ohio, uh, my immigrant family, we ate, you know, pasta some days because my mom actually really enjoyed the freedom that America gave her as an Indian woman to not spend all the time in the kitchen that Indian women uh, like her would have spent back home. And sometimes we ate Indian food because she wanted us to have something of where she came from and to sustain the past forward. Uh, so, so these people are trying to get folks killed with lies about what immigrants eat. But I wanted to share with folks, in my experience, uh, what immigrants do eat. I, you know, Anna, you, you remind me um, of so many immigrants that I've spoken to through the years, whether in Congress or as an attorney or TV. And, um, you know, I, I believe in America. I, I, I believe in the promise of America because, you know, as I said yesterday on the wall of my house is my grandma uh, in rural Georgia outside of a shack that her, her father built. They struggled through the Great Depression, but she sent her kids to college locally. And, and their kids sent their kids to college and, the Amer and, you know, they achieved the American dream. And so that's really inspiring. But I will say... What I find even more inspiring are all the immigrants I've talked to over the past 30 or 40 years or so. And they tell me exactly what you're telling me, which is, I'm working this job. I'm making this sacrifice. I'm doing everything I can do. My son is going to the school. He's going to be a computer programmer or he's got a job on Wall Street, or he's going to do whatever. And, and I always say this to native-born Americans who are cynical about this country. I say, go talk to an immigrant, because so many of those people, they still believe that America is the land of opportunity, like no other land. And it's, that's what, it's actually what I know a lot of people that watch this show don't like a lot of things Ronald Reagan did. They don't like his legacy of smaller government. But that's what Ronald Reagan understood that today's Republicans don't understand. If you really want to hear about the greatness of America, talk to an immigrant that just moved here and is building his, his family, is building his small business, is building his dreams and they will sacrifice what it takes so their children can stand on their shoulders. You know, we're in the 7 a.m. hour and I have seared in my memory, I had the privilege in my job of reporting from around the world. There is a 7 a.m. image that I have seen in many, many countries around the world, which a lot of Americans watching this may not have seen, which is that at 7 a.m. in capitals around the world, when life is not very active in particular cities, there is a long line always outside the American embassy or the American consulate, right? When life is at a standstill at 7 a.m. in New Delhi, India, there is a line outside mm. that embassy. We here, sitting around this table, sitting at home, may be in a funk about America. We may be despairing about America. We may think our democracy is unraveling and this is happening and that's happening and everything's going to the dogs. But even when we are in our deepest funk, that line, I have never seen that line go down. That line is like a concert line in capital after capital after capital. So instead of thinking of, instead of just having this conversation about how do we protect the border, let's step back Let's channel what Ronald Reagan said in that farewell address, where we remember we are a country made of the world. And it is actually the secret of our greatness. And the fact that even at our lowest lows, there are concert lines around the world for people trying to get in on this dream. It should make us buck up, but it should also make us remember yeah. not to shut this country to the energy yeah. and new blood that has always made it what it is. It re really has. And, and, you know, Willie, Annan's right. Uh, you know, I, be I believe we have to protect the border. I think more importantly than that even is protecting the dream, protecting the American dream. You remember at the end of Gladiator, and I can't wait to see Gladiator too. Oh, where, where uh, Yeah. 
Rome was, you know, there once was a dream called Rome. And, and you know, that moved me because America is a dream, not a dream for people like me, whose families lived here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. America is a dream for all of us, all of us that are here, every single American. And for that immigrant who's waking up at four in the morning and going to work hard all day to come home so their family has a shot at that American dream, the dream that started with them coming here. I mean, no other country in the world has that. Even, you know, you, you hear the same thing from people who come here from Britain. I mean, who, who, talks, who talks about the American dream in a way uh, more movingly than Roger Bennett? He says that when he goes home and visits, he, he loves home, he loves Manchester, he said, but when he lands in Amer or Liverpool, when he lands in America and the wheels touch down at JFK, he says every time the plane, those wheels hit the ground, said energy just rushes through his body because he understands when he gets off that plane, his accent doesn't matter. Where he came from doesn't matter. You know, where he went to school doesn't matter. What matters is his ideas, how hard he works, and how much he's willing to do as far as through hard work and dedication to achieve that American dream. That's just so inspiring. I, I don't know how, how people can take such a negative jaundiced view of America, but they do. Yeah, and that's part of what makes this Springfield, Ohio story so maddening and so sickening on so many levels by people who know better, who know what's actually happening, which is Haitians flee, fled their home country because of everything that's going on there, because they don't feel safe there, because they don't have the opportunities there that they could have here, came here legally, settled in Springfield, Ohio. And aside from people like Donald Trump and J.D. Vance and other people who are trying to glom onto this and rush into town and make some hay for themselves out of this, the people actually in the town the mayor, the business owners say they have changed. Yes, it's a shock to the system when that many people come and they put strains on our health care and other things. But we've also brought them in and they've started businesses and they've filled jobs and re-energized many of our industries that have been lagging here in Springfield, Ohio. So the, the story of what listen to the story of Springfield, Ohio, from the people who actually live there not from people trying to make political hay out of it. Anand Girdardis starting a great conversation as he always does for us. Anand, thanks so much, we appreciate Thank it.